the Board B a quality mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards of traceability and care for the environment. It's amazing how quickly Christmas comes around and already it's that time of year to start thinking about the food you're going to serve. I think most people like the combination of the routine of Christmas and the traditions that go with it, including of course the food. I like to serve all the classics, beef, ham, turkey and lamb, but I also like to give each dish just a little twist, bearing in mind that I'm cooking for a wide range of ages and expectations. So I hope that you'll get some inspiration from this Christmas edition of Home Chef. A big platter like this is wonderful served as a start on Christmas Day or if you're having a drinks party. All the elements can be made ahead and you're gonna wow your guests. So I'm gonna go through each element and they're relatively very easy to prepare and you can make them well ahead. So the first element is some pickled beetroot. Slice the beetroot really, really thinly or you can use the pre-cooked beetroot and pickle it in creme de cassis red wine and sugar. It's lovely, sweet, sour. So when that's cold, what you do is you beat up some cream cheese. We use some Carleggi goat's cheese with some soft herbs. We have some balsamic syrup, which is a reduction of balsamic and a little bit of port. And it's a wonderful dressing, even over salad or root vegetables. Just garnish that with a little edible flour from my garden. It's a borage flour. Now for the fish element of this platter, I'm using some hot smoked salmon. Whiz it up in the food processor with some creme fraiche, some chopped dill and a little bit of lemon zest and juice. It's very light and very, very fragrant. I'm serving this with some homemade brown bread that we make in the restaurant, but you can also serve it with some crackers. The next one is air dried ham and it's similar to Parma ham, a continental style ham. All I've done is mix up some mascarpone cheese or you can use ricotta with some fresh basil pesto. Smear that over that sliced ham, put some lovely wild rocket which is lovely and peppery and then simply roll them. So there's a real fun element into this and this is where something maybe you can get your kids involved in. The next element is spiced beef. I got the spiced beef from the English market in Cork. All I did was just simply roast it, or you can boil it. Simply chop that and mix that into some mashed potato with whole grain mustard and some herbs. I've used chives in this, and I've also used some parsley. Then my flour, egg, and bread crumb it, so they look like a little potato croquette, and they are absolutely bursting with flavor. To serve with the spiced beef croquettes, I have some mayonnaise with some crushed garlic and some chopped chives. Again, these can be done ahead. And the last element of the platter is a little bit of air-dried beef. What I've done is pickled some fennel bulb. So slice the fennel bulb really, really thin, make up a pickling liquor with some white wine vinegar, a touch of sugar, some herbs, and that is really, really good. Some thyme works really well, and let that pickle for a day or two. On top of this, we have some hard cheese, and we're using a Gabriel or Desmond. The Gabriel cheeses, which I've used from West Cork, works really well. I've garnished it with some rocket flowers, also some microgreens, and some cracked black pepper. And I think when you present this to your guests, they're gonna be rushing to the table. For me, ham is such an important part of the food at Christmas. It's worth taking your time and making it extra special. I'm gonna show you a really lovely glaze, which you can make a couple of days ahead. What goes into it is cider. So this is a dry cider here. I'm gonna put in some orange juice. So this gives a lovely refreshing taste to the glaze. Ground cloves in here, roughly about half a teaspoonful because they're quite strong. Four whole star anise goes in here. And this is the lovely Irish honey from Irish Bee Sensation, which I'm using. We're going to bring it to the boil, and this is going to take between 10 to 15 minutes to reduce and become syrupy. Whisk and combine everything together. What darkens it is the cloves. Traditionally, I suppose, with a glaze, it used to be just a little bit of whole grain mustard or, or English mustard and brown sugar and stud with cloves. So it's amazing to see the changes in the glaze. The star is the ham, without doubt. This is the quality assured Irish ham, which I've just cooked, boiled up in some cider, water, and some root vegetables, celery, 
leeks, carrots and some herbs. And a soft herb like that, one bay leaf would be lovely in time, that's all. The ham is on a trivet, silicone paper underneath. When the glaze would naturally will drip down on, that it's not gonna catch and stick to the tray. So you just, with a sharp knife, cut this off. So I'm trimming off some excess fat, but the fat gives it moisture when you are cooking it. Now I'm gonna score it. Helps the glaze stick, which is really important. Don't go too deep using the point of the knife. So what I'm gonna do next is create a lovely diamond shape is just go the opposite angle. Don't score too deep into the actual ham and go right down to the bottom. So this helps the glaze stick and gives a lovely, lovely presentation so it does. So the glaze, that has been reducing and that takes a good 10 to 15 minutes until it's like a, a thick honey consistency which is perfect. Now we're going to brush this and the trick into doing this is to make sure the ham is cold because if the ham is hot, the glaze is going to run off. So just using a pastry brush, I can smell the star anise the orange and, of course, the cloves. Now, the oven preheated at 180. So don't forget, every 15 minutes, keep brushing it with the glaze. What I'm going to show you next is a lovely cranberry and apple relish. It works really well with the ham. Lovely in a sandwich, and it's lovely as a little gift that you can give to your family and friends. In the pan, I have unsweetened apple juice. So the first thing we're going to do is red wine vinegar. I'm using a nice dark brown sugar in this. Whisk this to dissolve it. So I'm going to put my spices in. First one is some cinnamon stick. There's two cinnamon sticks in there, and then some allspice. If you can't get allspice, you can use cinnamon. Roughly about half a teaspoonful goes in. You bring this to the boil, and I'm gonna put a little splash of port, and this works really well with the cranberries and the apple. Let it reduce, not unlike actual glaze, until it's nice and thick and syrupy. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dice my apple and put in my cranberries. So I've just peel the apple, I'm gonna cube this nice and small. Fine little cube, or you can grate it if you're stuck for time. But what works really well is the zest of an orange in this too. When I make a homemade cranberry sauce, I usually um, cook it in some port, red wine, balsamic vinegar and brown sugar, and a touch of cinnamon. You have a lovely touch of spice there, sweet and sour. That's exactly the best way to describe it. So after 15 minutes, it's nicely reduced, thickened, and then we just gotta taste it. Mm. It's sweet, and that's what I want because these are quite bitter, the cranberries. Now, before I put in the cranberries, I'm going to put in the diced apple. Just stir them through, and then I'm going to put in the fresh cranberries, and what you'll hear when it comes back to the boil, you'll hear these popping. They're tart, they add so much texture to, because I don't want them to cook too much, I want to stew them. So I want a little bit of shape on them to know that you're eating the cranberries. So you can hear them popping. So all I want is to cook them for five minutes until they've kept their shape, but they are cooked. Look at how beautiful that is. Lovely and colorful. When the cranberries are just cooked, remove the cinnamon sticks, pour it into a Kindler jar, and then it's ready to be served. Here's a salad using a vegetable people think they don't like because they have memories of mushy, overcooked sprouts. First make the French dressing. Put some vinegar in a screw top jar and add some Dijon mustard, some sugar, a pinch of salt, a crushed clove of garlic and some extra virgin olive oil. Shake the jar vigorously to dissolve the sugar and to create a thick emulsion. Finally shred some Brussels sprouts. These are uncooked of course and transfer them to a glass bowl. Pour on the dressing and then finely chop some chives. Add these to the shredded sprouts and then add some dried cranberries. Mix it all together well so that everything is coated with the dressing. Place the salad in a serving bowl and then as a final flourish, add some pomegranate seeds and some toasted flaked almonds. I challenge the most ardent sprout hater not to like this crisp, fresh, crunchy salad. How good does that look? Smells amazing. It should be absolutely delicious to eat. So I've glazed it three times in the hour and the oven was at 180 degrees. What a beautiful piece of meat. Ham is such a great meat to cook at Christmas and you can get so many meals from this joint. Also, you can make lots of dishes using leftovers. That's my cider glazed ham with the cranberry and apple relish and the Brussels sprout salad. Fit to grace any table at Christmas. The Board Be A Quality Mark.
ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards. The Board Bia Quality Mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards of traceability and care for the environment. Last year I cooked turkey and I marinated it in buttermilk, rosemary, garlic and some sliced orange. I have never got a reaction to any recipe I've ever done on television, I have to tell you. So popular, the creameries ran out of buttermilk, would you believe that? This year I'm going to do a crown of turkey and I'm using some quality assured Irish turkey so I am. I'm going to show you something a little bit different, which is making a spiced butter with some herbs and citrus. It's really, really good. So have your butter nice and soft, that's the first thing. We're going to grate in the zest of an orange. And there's something when you cook turkey, or even chicken, citrus works so well. You could use some limes in this too. So it's just the rind I'm using in this. So we're going to put one clove of garlic into this. Just crush it in and scrape this out. I'm putting in this interesting paste. It's a harissa paste, slightly spicy, but it's not going to overpower or have the turkey too spicy. Got to put in some fresh thyme. Pick the small little sprigs, and then we're going to take off the leaves. You can put sage into this. Tarragon works really well, even a little bit of basil. It's the one day of the year that people cook for large numbers of people that they're not normally used to cooking for when you're entertaining at Christmas. Last year, I had nearly 40 people for Christmas lunch, and I love it. We always have turkey, done some different way, and goose. It's the one day that can spoil my family and my aunts and my uncles. This butter can keep for up to two to three weeks in your fridge. Mix everything together with the back of the spoon. So you can see the herbs, the harissa paste, and that's the butter ready. Now, a really good tip for you, roll it in cling film. This will keep for two or three weeks in your fridge or else you can freeze it for up to two months. So what I'm gonna do next is put the butter underneath the skin of the turkey. And this is the crown of the turkey. It's on the bone, so it's gonna keep it really moist and succulent. Peel it back with your fingers, put that in there just to make a pocket. With the butter, just literally push it back with the spoon. So that's going to keep it really, really moist. So you can have this done Christmas Eve, store it in the fridge, really important. Same for the other breast. Rub this in, press it down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to smear this all over the outside. So I'm using my hands, but you can use a pastry brush for this if you want to. Now making sure I completely coat the turkey all over. Now you've got to wash your hands. So I have the oven preheated at 190. That's really, really important. Just before it goes into the oven, just a little drizzle of oil, and then we're going to put some sea salt, lots of sea salt over it, and then some black pepper. This was the beautiful thing about a crown, a turkey. Easy to carve, keeps it moist, keeps its shape, which is really good. So with the legs of the turkey, ask your butcher just to bone and roll them, and they will be delicious roasted separately. This needs to go into the oven for 20 minutes per pound, plus 20 minutes. If it's browning too much in the oven, you cover it with tin foil. So while that's in the oven, I'm going to show you a beautiful stuffing. We're going to cook off some onions in some butter. Heat the pan and put that in and melt the butter. Dried apricots. I'm going to chop these because they're a little bit big. This is a lovely stuffing, even if you're doing a line of pork. Really, really beautiful. OK, butter's melted. In goes the onion, first of all. Dice the onion nice and small. Herbs, I'm using some flat leaf parsley, but you can use the likes of thyme works really well in this. So this is sage, and you can just keep it very basic. If you just want a simple stuffing with some onion and sage, this is exactly how you make it. The fruit gives it lovely moisture, texture, and gives great flavor to the stuffing. Cook this out for a minute. Nice high heat. Put in, first of all, the dried cranberries. In goes your apricots, and then in goes your toasted pine nuts. Really important you toast the nuts because you get the lovely natural flavors. Salt, and lots of black pepper. Cook this out until it's nice and soft. After five minutes, you have this lovely consistency. The fruits have kind of plumped up because they've absorbed the butter. The onions are softened and the herbs are cooked through, so the smells are gorgeous. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix everything together. So in goes the breadcrumbs. Plain white breadcrumbs. Scrape all this out and then just stir this through. So the breadcrumbs will absorb all the moisture. I think every household has their own recipe for stuffing, and this is definitely ours. Large sheet of tin foil, and the two sheets of it make like a rough sausage shape. Just when it's warm, gather it all together. So you can use your hands, even though it's hot, and then roll it up. So nice and tight. 
just tie in either end, and that's it there. Couldn't be easier. That will keep happily in your fridge when it's cold for at least four days. And what you can do for the last 45 minutes when you're cooking the turkey, you put that on the trivet and that will cook it through and then you just slice it up. So when the turkey comes out of the oven, make sure to let it rest. What that does, it lets all the juices stay in the turkey, keeps it lovely and moist and succulent. To keep it nice and warm, wrap it in tin foil. So with the turkey, I have some roast potatoes. Par cook your potatoes, roast them with some garlic, some herbs, rosemary, thyme works really well, and a little bit of rapeseed oil. The roasted vegetables, so I pick some parsnip, carrot, a little bit of red onion. You can also use beetroot. Roast them with some honey, a little bit of oil, and some herbs. Simple but delicious. The stuffing, what I've done is put a little bit of butter over the top of the stuffing, so it's like a crumble texture, which is really, really good. And of course, the last thing has to be the gravy. This is made from the juices of the turkey, a little bit of herbs in that, like thyme works really well, white wine, and a little bit of chicken stock. So I hope you give this way of cooking the turkey a go this Christmas. The spices work really well, and give this traditional recipe an interesting twist. It's Christmas. So allow yourself a little indulgence with these chocolate truffles, which also make a perfect gift. Bring some cream to the boil and then add in some butter. Whisk until it's melted and then add some sweetened chestnut puree. This gives the truffles a distinctive Christmassy taste. Add the chocolate and whisk until it's smooth and glossy before transferring into a bowl to cool. You could add flavours such as Contra or Cool Swan instead of the chestnut puree if you prefer. The mixture needs to cool and set in the fridge before it can be shaped into these little balls. A melon baller dipped in hot water is the easiest way to do this. If you dip the truffles into melted chocolate, you create a crispy chocolate shell. You need good quality chocolate for this and this one has 55% cocoa solids. The shine is fantastic. You can also roll the truffles in cocoa powder, toasted desiccated coconut, and ground pistachios. It's important to use unsalted pistachios for this. We serve these truffles in the restaurant as petty furs on a bed of cocoa nibs, but put them into a box and give them as a present and enjoy the pleasure a homemade gift brings. Plum pudding is perhaps the one part of the Christmas dinner that not everyone enjoys, so there's often a lot left over. Here's a great recipe, but don't think of it as just a way of using up leftovers. You can make this Christmas day itself, and I think that even people who don't like plum pudding will love this dessert. So the first thing I'm going to do is light the hob and I'm going to caramelise the plum pudding using some caster sugar. So I'm going to make a nice caramel from this, and then some butter. So this is going to take a minute or two to caramelise. You want it until it becomes light and golden brown and it's not as sweet. If you want to, you could also try this with some mincemeat and if you have any Christmas cake. So this is a great way for using leftovers, but it's a beautiful dessert on its own. So the secret when you're making this, keep stirring it, keep the pan on nice and high. Then we're going to pour in our rum, stand back, and this is what you call a flambe. So don't be looking over the pan, it's extremely hot. You're cooking off the alcohol, but you're making the most delicious caramel. So let's get our plum pudding and just break it up. And this is going to caramelise in this beautiful caramel with the rum. Now you can use a little drop of whiskey. You can use both if you want to, after all it is Christmas. So what I want to do is turn down the pan. Now I always offer Christmas pudding for my family, but also baked Alaska. So this is nearly ready. I'm kind of just pressing it down a little bit, just to break down the plum pudding and I've turned down the heat. That's really important or it will burn. It'll over caramelize, which I don't want. That's ready. What I have here is a small little tray with parchment paper. This will stop it from sticking. Just spread it all over. Now be really careful. Do not be tempted to put the spoon in there and taste it. You will burn your mouth and you'll not be talking or singing over the Christmas. I can guarantee you that. So it's extremely hot. That's what we have. Sticky, sweet, absolutely gorgeous. So this can be done a couple of days ahead. And that's the beautiful thing about making paraffins. First of all, make the caramel. We're going to use some water and then some sugar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a sugar syrup with the sugar and the water. You just whisk it. And what's going to happen here, it's going to boil. It's going to reduce. Now, I want it to get it to a correct temperature. And this is a great thing to have because it's very particular on the temperature. It's a sugar thermometer. And I'm going to bring it up to 120 degrees, which will take about 15 minutes. While that's on cooking, I'm just going to prepare the vanilla. And I'm going to flavor the Christmas pudding parfait with some vanilla. We've also rum in there, you have all the spices. 
So this is just a basic paraffin mixture and then we're adding in plum pudding. Three egg yolks, one vanilla pod. So after 15 minutes, just hold the base of the thermometer in and it should read softball, which is approximately about 120. So what I'm going to do, now lift that out, be very careful, and they are fragile. They're worth getting, but they're fragile. You have to store them very, very carefully in your kitchen. We're going to beat our egg yolks, three egg yolks, with some vanilla pot. And I'm going to very slowly pour this in on top of the egg yolks, just at the side. So I'm just cooking the egg yolks. Let that whisk now for about five to ten minutes until it's thick and it's cooled down. So after about 10 minutes, the mixture is nice and cool and it has thickened up. You can see all the lovely vanilla seeds. Now I'm gonna add in some whipped cream. The cream is already whisked, lovely soft peaks. And then just whisk this in. So that's your basic paraffin made. Now don't overmix it. At this stage, you can add lots of different flavorings, liqueurs. This is the plum pudding, which I caramelized. I could not emphasize enough this has got to be cool. If it goes in hot, it's going to be a mess. And it's going to soften the whole paraffin. And I'm just going to chop this. It's sticky. Everything you want, chop this into nice big chunks. You can hear the crunch, and that's from the caramel. And it'll stick to the board, don't worry. And then you sprinkle this in. Divide it with your fingers. It's the, probably the easiest way. Whisk this in. And kind of just break down a little bit. So it begins to lightly color the paraffin. We're going to fill our molds, and this will remind you or your guests of a little plum pudding. And these are little pudding basins, they're called. We're going to spoon in the paraffin. Just bring it right over. And you can shape these into anything, even a brown bread loaf tin, nearly to the top. And then at the back of the spoon, just spread it out. Now, that's them ready. They need to go into the freezer, and if you can make this, definitely overnight. You can cover them in cling film, you can put a sheet of parchment paper just to protect them, and they will keep really well for up to a week in your freezer. So I have some already in the freezer. And this is them here. Now when you serve a paraffin, give it a couple of minutes to come to room temperature, because it's quite solid. As you can see, it's firm to the touch, exactly what you want. And I'm just going to show you how to unmold these. So what you do is just dip the paraffin mold just into some boiling water. And then just with the point of the knife, run it around. Now, let's see what this pop out. Perfect. So it's beginning to soften already, perfect. What I'm going to serve with this is a rum creme anglaise. This is like a custard with egg yolks. There's a touch of corn flour in this to thicken it. Milk, cream, rum, and vanilla. Pour this around. And then I'm gonna show you how to feather using some raspberry coulee, which is a puree of raspberries. If it's seasonal, of course, you could use some puree of cranberries. And just with the cocktail stick, just move it in and out. How good does that look? That's my plum pudding paraffin with the rum creme anglaise. And all that's left for me to say is to wish you all a very happy Christmas and a peaceful new year. And most importantly, enjoy the good food. The Board Be A Quality Mark, ensuring your food is produced to the highest standards.